can't wait. This is a Kemp Foundation oral history project interview with former Senator, Cabinet Secretary, and Republican National Chairman Bill Brock. Today is June 23rd, 2011, and I'm Morton Kondracki. Uh, Senator Brock, when you think about Jack Kemp, what immediately comes to mind? Energy, excitement, passion, uh, I, you know, everything that makes you interested in and fascinated with a human being who uh, is willing to stick his neck out. One of his former assistants wrote an obituary when he died saying that Jack Kemp was the most influential politician of the 20th century who was not president. Now, down at the Miller Center, when you participated in the Kemp uh, Oral History Project, you said, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know how you say anybody's the best congressman in a century, but I know in my lifetime uh, he had greater impact than anybody else that I can think of. You were talking about particularly the tax issues, but where do, where do you put Kemp in history of our time? I think the the contribution that Jack made was in shifting the normal conversation away from uh, the mechanics of economics, away from uh, people who say, "Well, we got to have more man more uh, you know more revenue." The same kind of debate we got in this country today, or or less spending. He shifted the debate by saying, you can reduce the rate of taxation and in the process increase incentives, increase uh, growth, increase employment, and thereby produce uh, more revenues. I think there were people who thought that before, but he was able to articulate that with more passion and more clarity than any other person in that particular uh, time period. And it shifted the conversation into one of more positive, uh, a more positive look at economic policy in terms of could it be, instead of the dismal uh, science, perhaps it could be the more optimistic science. And that sense of optimism did did have an enormous impact. You know, I I knew. Uh, an awful lot of people had an awful lot of impact. Hubert Humphrey, uh, you know, George McGovern, in his very you know different way, not on my side, but people, uh, people who make a contribution are people who get engaged, and who are not afraid to put their their name on the line and their passion on the line. Jack was a star in that regard. When did you first hear about him? Probably, uh, I'm not quite sure what year he came to the uh, to the house. 1970. Was it? It was the same 70 election. year. Yeah, same same year that I was elected to the Senate. I was probably uh, <laughs> focused more on myself in that first year in the Senate than anything else, trying to figure out what I could do to to get things going on my own behalf. But it couldn't have been very long after that before you began to sense that in that freshman class in the, in the house, uh, which I had just left, there were some really uh, exciting new people that were hard chargers and that were going to change the conversation. Jack was probably foremost among those. So my guess is that I began to pay attention to him certainly in the first couple of years of my time in the Senate. And when did you first actually meet him? Couldn't have been long after that because we were working in similar areas. Uh, I had uh, uh, some pretty strong feelings on the, uh, the absence of a good economic policy on the part of the president. Uh, uh, I'm a Republican, I supported Nixon. But Nixon was driving me crazy. Uh, wage and price controls, uh, abandoning the gold standard. Uh, I didn't mind abandoning the gold standard. I, I minded doing it without any 
uh, seemingly alternative uh, uh, conversation about what that meant. And Jack Kemp began to take on the issue of getting away from the gold standard. So my, my guess is that we would have had some conversations as a part of a group. I'm not sure that we had one-on-one -on -one conversations that early, but it, clear, it was clear to me that uh, we were going to move to more, uh, more contact as that t time went on. And that was before Jack began to pick up on this idea of shifting uh, the conversation to one of uh, increased growth. He was talking more about maintaining economic stability. The, the gold standard in his mind was a real uh, anchor uh, to keep this country from going, becoming irresponsible and spending our way to success. Uh, I didn't agree with that that was the right anchor, but I certainly agreed with that goal. And I particularly felt that we were way off track in trying to control wage and prices simply because the Arabs were embargoing oil and running the price of oil up. My recollection is that you and he co-sponsored some sort of bill to rein in the Fed or control the Fed, limit the Fed's authority. You'll have to give me a bit more than that. I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, talking about your house districts, now you had a working class house district. Yes. He had a working class house district. Right. What was the key to Republicans winning working class districts? And was there any similarity between yours and his? Yeah, I think there was. Um, I don't think either one of us was afraid to talk to people in labor. I had the support of organizations like the Teamsters Union uh, because I went over there and, and met and said, look, you guys are the front lines of our economy. Uh, Jack was doing exactly the same thing in, in that Buffalo area. When you look at a district like his, like mine, that had a tradition of being more democratic, uh, there was no way you're going to change that district by talking to the powers that be, because the powers that be were either Democrats or were people who said, well, I, the only way I'm going to do business is by dealing with the extent or uh, political system. And so we had to get outside of the normal political system. I had opposition within the Republican Party because I was stirring the pot. I bet you he did the same thing. So you had to get out and find out where in the neighborhoods you had people who were worried sick about their kids, about their jobs, about things that were going on in the country that they felt out of, you know, were out of control, that they didn't have any voice. And both of us, I think, felt, uh, and I think demonstrated by our, our actions, that maybe the most important thing we could do in politics was to give people a sense that they really did have a voice and that we could be that voice because we were out there listening, knocking on doors, talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, and expressing real outrage when we saw things that we didn't like. Uh, I'm a pretty passionate guy, and Jack was, and I think maybe uh, that was one of the reasons I was so comfortable with him because I felt like uh, he had his heart on his sleeve, and he was never afraid to get into it and fight for what he believed in. There are too many people that... Uh, are just sort of there because it's a good job. You know, they love to get elected and they love all the praise, but uh, getting out and really fighting for something was not in their, in their gene, DNA. You were both members of the Chowder and Marching Society. Now, would Jack have been admitted to the Chowder and Marching Society as a freshman or? Very when? quickly. Um, it certainly would have been in the first, if no more than first term, it would be, uh, I guess it was probably the, f the second year that he was in Congress. I'd have to check the record. But the thing about Chowder and Marching, uh, it really is an organization of Republican active members, and they want somebody from every committee so that you can talk about every Wednesday night what's going on at the different committees so that we could be sure that we knew what was going on, and, and that way we could reinforce each other and work together. Uh, Jack moved into that conversation uh, 
say like a tornado, but he brought he, he brought some energy to it, and 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 caused a bit of a problem uh, for a couple of the older members who said, you know, slow down, slow down. Let's let's make sure that we're all listening to each other. And Jack was better talking sometimes, and when people didn't agree with him, he pushed. So uh, that sort of that. To me, that showed that he was brash. Uh, it took me a while to make sure that I agreed with what he was saying, so much so that I said, yeah, we, we need this. During the Nixon days, was Chowder and Marching a place that you recall him ever saying anything about wage price controls or Watergate or any of the big issues at the time? or in any other context for that matter. Yeah, I, we, we certainly talked about wage and price controls. There were not a lot of us in that group that found that a, a comfortable policy. Uh, I, 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 I simply was flabbergasted that any Republican would, uh, would do something like that. Now, I had had a lot of respect for the president. I thought uh, he had proven his Mark, by hanging into politics with, after some very tough times, I had supported him in 68 and supported him in 72. And here comes this, this guy who uh, is supposed to be the leader of our party saying that uh, government should be intervening in the entire, every aspect of the economy. And I exploded, and, but I did so probably pretty quietly on the outside. It was inside that we were talking, and, and there was a lot of anger. I have no doubt that Jack was a part of that just because uh, that was so alien to what he believed in. Did you ever talk to him about Watergate? I don't remember talking to him about Watergate. Uh, I, we, in, in our conversations in those days, were so stunned at this, and frankly, nobody in that group, Jack, me, nobody else, thought that Nixon had anything to do with it. We honestly and truly said that nobody could be that stupid. Nobody in his position could do it. Uh, I'm not sure yet whether he had anything to do with the event, but having those people do it and then denying it, as we found out in the tapes, uh, was inex inexcusable and unforgivable. So I am quite sure that there was some angst over the event and what it was doing to us in the party. Uh, I don't think I heard anybody, Jack or anybody else, say that we were quite sure that Nixon was the one, as they, as they said, uh, until the tapes came out. Uh, moving to the Ford administration, um, Ford was combating inflation with the whip inflation now program, oh, yeah. pins, clean your plate, all that stuff. Did you and Jack have any conversations about that? I don't remember that. I, I, I don't remember any specific uh, development there. Ford won and I lost. So there was a bit of a disconnect at that point. My time was totally devoted to rebuilding the party as chairman. And I don't think uh, Jack and I would have had much of a conversation until he began to move into the, uh, into the uh, idea that became Kemp Roth. And right. when he came to see me, uh, it was on that issue, and I was national chairman, about convincing me that we needed to get the party out front. Let me, uh, let me just go back one step. Uh, in 1974, he was the sponsor of something called Kemp McClure, which was the alternative, the Republican alternative, or a Republican alternative right. to the Humphrey Hawkins bill. That's correct. Now, do you remember what you did about Kemp McClure? That was a capital formation. Yeah, I was, I was pretty aggressive. I thought uh, Humphrey Hawkins was an outrageously stupid approach. And uh, those that was Jack, uh, Jim McClure, a lot of us were very energized on that subject. And frankly, I'd forgotten Humphrey Hawkins. <laughs> I, 
I, I know, you know, you're thinking about it. Uh, that really got our attention, and it was one of those. That was a really fundamental debate between the two parties and the two ideologies. And Jack was a, 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 a critical leader in putting that that fight together. And obviously, we talked about how to make sure that we got every every one of our colleagues, but also as many Democrats as we could. And all of us knew some Democrats that we could talk to. So we would have been sharing uh, those names. So is, is it in that period that people in, in Chowder and Marching started ragging on him because he was exceeding his authority? Or what was the, well, there pro was, what was the problem? There was the a, a, a little bit of that. Here's a guy that's not the chairman of the committee, he's not the chairman of the subcommittee. Uh, and he's out leading a charge on something like uh, Kemp McClure. Uh, he didn't go through the Ways and Means. You know, that's the standard uh, place where you go. So you've got uh, people uh, uh, as leading the Ways and Means Committee who uh, uh, felt like they should have been uh, carrying that flag. But the problem is that they weren't. And, and Jack, uh, again, and the reason you had to at least uh, love him, uh, if not agree with him, and I happen to agree, uh, he was willing to just say, I cannot wait for the Republicans to do it. Barbara Conable was the chairman. Barbara uh, at least gave the impression that he was really uncomfortable with Jack uh, getting that aggressive. Uh, you know, the, the old boys club is, it's, it's real. When you've been there for 10, 15 years, I never had that experience. <laughs> uh, but when you've been there for 10 or 15 years and you're the ranking member of a committee and your buddy that you work with on the other side of the aisle is the chairman, you sort of have a, a, a modus vivendi that says, I'll take care of you know, things so that we can work together to reach a resolution. Uh, we may disagree, but we'll do it in ways that don't make each other uncomfortable. We're not going to un undercut each other. We're not going to come in and, and surprise each other. That's a good thing, by the way. It makes the system work. And when you have somebody like Jack <laughs> who comes in and says, I haven't got time for this. We've got we to gotta stop Humphrey Hawkins. We've got to get out there and beat the drums and go after this. Um, it makes people nervous. Now, I wasn't in the House at that time, but I was on, on the Chowder Marching, and that's where these conversations would take place, uh, and they could get pretty vigorous. Uh, As in what? Did he get dressed down? Well, it was probably a little bit more gracious than that, but the conversations about Jack doing it were probably more vigorous in, when he wasn't there than when he was. And What is this guy doing? Uh, why is he, who, who gave him the, the right to carry the flag kind of thing. It wasn't mean-spirited, it was just, come on, let's work with the system. And we were a minority, and we had a system that, uh, that we needed to, to be careful in. So he would catch the Dickens. Uh, in the, in the chatter and marching, it was more of a conversation. Okay, Jack, uh, how are you going to deal with the Democrats when they do this or that? And he would pretty much say, I don't have to deal with that. We've got an issue. It is too important to, to lay on the side of the road. Uh, we've got to get in there and fight, period. Uh, and I don't have to make compromises. I don't have to deal with it the politics. The politics are always on our side because we're doing the right thing. Describe the su surroundings of the Charter and March of Society. Where did you meet? How many people would show up? We would meet in a, one of the sort of mini conference rooms uh, on the House side. Once in a while we'd go in the Senate In the side. Capitol? In the Capitol, yeah, excuse me. Uh, always in the Capitol. Um, Want to cut it off? <coughs> so we're in. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me start again. Um, describe the Chowder and Marching Society. What was it? Where did it meet? 
how many people showed up? The, the meetings occurred every Friday afternoon, I mean, excuse me, every Wednesday afternoon at five when the Congress was in session. And the composition was designed basically to have at least one member from each substantial committee and some from particularly important subcommittees. Uh, there probably would be on average 20 of us at a given occasion. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. If the meetings were on uh, a day where there was really a lot of fervor going on in the, in the Congress. Go ahead. <coughs> Sorry. We can cut. Um, you could have probably maybe at most usually 25 to 26 uh, and almost never less than 18, 17 or 18. The idea was that having somebody from each of the major subject matter areas or, or jurisdictional areas that each of us would go around the room and say, this is what's happening in my area, so that I could know when I was on government operations or banking or whatever, uh, what was happening in Ways and Means or in Veterans Affairs, uh, because all of these things, we tend to operate in silos in Washington, and it's a reason the government doesn't work very well. You know, I take care of my tariff, I don't worry about yours. But all of these areas interact and what happens in one area will in inevitably have a lap over effect on any number of other uh, areas. So Charter Marching was set up as a group of people who really got to know each other and were close enough that we could be totally open, totally honest, and share not only what's happening in, in the committee, but what we thought about it, what was happening in the larger world, uh, and how could we work more effectively together. It, it, it was and is, I think, a, a terrifically important organization. And there are a couple of others. I don't think that anybody has achieved quite the degree of a unanimity and effective uh, communication that CNM has done, but uh, there may be some now that I don't, I'm unaware of. But it was, it was, a, it was a terrific place to get somebody engaged, a Jack Kemp, a Bill Brock, early on. Uh, and frankly, I think we were looking for people with leadership potential. I happen to say that because I was one of those, of, of the chosen, I guess. <laughs> well, it was sort of like the popular kids fraternity, wasn't it, yeah. within the Congress? And I'm not sure popular, but those who were seen to have uh, more influence than the norm in their particular class or in their particular area of competence. Uh, obviously, you wanted the, the, the most senior person, if you could get him a, a barber accountable from uh, Ways and Means or whatever. You wanted the leadership of the House, Bob Michael or Jerry Ford. But uh, you also wanted uh, people who would be around for a while and would add a, make a difference. Did you meet in the same room? We met, this, yes, almost in, always in the same room. We had it reserved every, every Wednesday afternoon. First floor of the Capitol? Second. Second. And did you eat, drink? No. We'd have snacks. Uh, sometimes if we knew it was going to be a long meeting, uh, maybe a few sandwiches, but mostly it was a, you know, a few soft drinks and, and some sandwiches at most. And how did somebody like Jack Kemp get admitted? Is, was there a nomination system? Yeah. Uh, actually, there was no formal system. Uh, there was no subcommittee that nominated. Uh, in the first few months, certainly in the first year, somebody would begin to stand out and that name would be presented to the body. What do you, what do you all think about bringing Jack M? What do you think about so-and-so? Uh, we talk about it, maybe not make a decision for a couple of meetings, maybe more. Watch what they're doing, how they're doing. 
But it was really interesting. I don't remember any serious debate uh, when somebody's name was brought up uh, where people just half were for and half against. It became pretty much a consensus operation. He was the freshman class president, and he was a football player, and Richard Nixon at one point said, uh, here's, you know, toasted him, or, or I guess when one, one of his kids was born, said that uh, he's the, the son of the fu future vice president of the United States or something like that. So he was a figure of some stature. Then. Absolutely. Yeah, coming in. So he would have been admitted reasonably pretty, early? Pretty quickly, yeah. Um, going back now to the times when he was going out of his area of expertise and sort of shaking things up. Uh, besides Barbara Connell the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, who else thought that he was getting out of line? I shouldn't have put Barbara Connell's name out there as the, as the only one. I'm reluctant to add many others because I don't think that's entirely fair. Uh, there were a couple of people uh, in the New York delegation, for example, that uh, would tend to think, uh, here's a guy that's grabbing the headlines and maybe he ought to stick to his knitting and uh, earn his spurs before he got out and told the rest of us how to think. Well, Barbara Carnival was New York, so who uh, else but, was there? Uh, <laughs> my guess is that maybe Charlie, Charlie uh, Goodell and some of those, uh, and I sh I, I'm being I wish I hadn't started the naming because I think that uh, you can't stop uh, and, and it may be, it certainly is unfair to single out a couple of people. Well, so was it a widespread feeling in the chowder and marching? Uh, there were enough there to make it on occasion a little bit uncomfortable uh, and it was, it was frankly the, the older guys. I've heard But we had that conversation constantly in charter marching. I mean, the fact, Lee, I was a young Turk when I came in in 1962, or I started in 63, and some of us, including the Charlie Goodells and, and, and others, decided that we didn't like the Republican leadership. And we took on Charlie Halleck. Halleck was, Charlie was the leader of the House uh, from Indiana. And he was, in our view, a lovely man who was past his prime. It was not giving aggressive leadership to these young guys who wanted, wanted to take on the world. And we put together the, the group that uh, elected Jerry Ford and replaced Charlie Halleck. Well, we took on the old guard when we did that. And there is always tension in these things. So that was not entirely the same thing with Jack, but, but um, there was a, a division. Some of the guys that had been around for a while thought that Jack was moving a little too fast. I've heard the name Mel Laird as being one of the people who... That's probably a pretty good, uh, yeah. And what was Mel Laird's position in those days? Uh, he was, I'm not sure what the title was, but Mel was arguably the, uh, the second most consequential guy in the in the House membership. He was a very, very smart, very able, very tough politician. And uh, and Mel was one who wanted the party to hew a consistent line. So he would have been a little bit cautious about somebody getting out in front of the troops. Mm -hmm. And did you share these um Feelings that no, that camp was too branch. No, no, because I was I was not entirely in the same area, but uh, I was charging a lot of areas my, on myself, and the, I have for, for I think for the entire time I was in the House and Senate uh, felt like we needed to be a little more aggressive. Uh, I mean, we were fighting hard. I'm not saying we weren't aggressive. But maybe the word is we needed to be more creative. We needed to grab some issues that were not uh, in the normal 
category of things being debated. We were debating mundane things in our view, and we needed to get out in front of some issues and say, this is not enough. We've got to get some more excitement going. So in uh, 1976, the Republicans get clobbered. clobbered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then you become Republican national chairman, and yeah. eventually you see to it that Kemp Roth, the mm -hmm. across-the-board tax cuts, become Republican Party policy. But previous to that, um, in 1976, you supported Jerry Ford, and Kemp supported Ronald Reagan in the Republican primaries. Yeah. Um, did you have any discussions about that, about who you were for, and did, did you have any thoughts about why Kemp was supporting Reagan? Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, Jack, Jack was going to grab Reagan because Reagan was new, he was different, and was, he was an energizing candidate. I had been for Jerry Ford when we overthrew the House leadership in the early 60s. Uh, I was there when he was named vice president and then when he had assumed the office of the presidency. And I felt uh, that the party owed him the right to stay on and complete the work. Uh, and I did not like the fact that Jack and uh, others uh, supported uh, Reagan against an incumbent Republican president. Uh, I, I didn't, I don't know whether we had any overt disagreements of any, you know, any fervor, but it was pretty clear that uh, I thought the party owed Jerry Ford support, and I did not feel uh, that it was right and fair to turn on him. And I felt that uh, Jack and others were uh, were not not doing the right thing as party loyalists. Did you yourself have a conversion to supply side economics? Probably. Uh, it was not uh, actually on the road to Damascus, but. Uh, Looking at my economic philosophy over the years, I, I was a fairly classic Republican in the in the worry that government was becoming an overweening influence, uh, and that that was distorting uh, the economy and causing us to slow slow growth. And we were too interventionist on the wrong things, wage and price controls, uh, things like that, and not enough supportive of those things that would add energy to the private sector where the jobs were. But I was sort of a classic uh, economic uh, uh, economist at that time. Uh, I didn't like, well, for example, I got into, uh, with Muskie and I wrote the, uh, the bill that passed the Senate to reform the Congressional, or to create a Congressional budget process because I didn't think that Congress was in any way uh, responsible f enough to, to deal with these issues without any coherent uh, format and plan. All of those are more on the traditional side. When you saw uh, some pretty good arguments coming from the Kemp's, uh, Art Laffler's and others, that said, um, we can grow this economy by reducing the drain that government imposes on the private sector and thereby solve both problems, get more energy, uh, reduce taxes, get more growth. Uh, it was intuitively logical. We just hadn't thought about it in that creative way up until that time. And I do think that uh, they made an enormous difference in giving us a new focus on how to get energy going. Uh, I should add one thing. One of the people that I loved as a human being was Bill Steiger, terrific young member of Congress in Wisconsin. In the late 60s, when the campuses were going to hell in a handbasket, we had tear gas and, and, uh, and all of the rest of the misery that uh, the Vietnam War had engendered. 
uh, Bill and I put together a group, this is before Jack came to Congress, to go out, all of us as young Republicans, and visit 50 college campuses. We came back and out of that we, we presented to the President in the White House uh, with Nixon there of the 18-year-old vote so that these kids could be given a voice before they were drafted uh, and the all-volunteer army. Uh, so Steiger and I had gotten very close and Bill Steiger just adopted as his primary fight in life uh, a, a, a reduction in the capital gains tax. We were taxing capital and taxing the energy of this country in it. And so I had gotten on that side of the equation very o aggressively and su was supporting it uh, both in Congress, House and Senate, and then again uh, when I was national chairman. What Jack brought to it was something that went beyond capital gains. He talked about the tax, the income tax, as something that affected any, any, every individual and therefore was draining uh, resources of, away from our energy base personal energy base. So uh, that became really, really interesting and attractive to me. And I was looking, by the way, I was trying to transform the Republican Party. We were anti, at least in perception terms, anti-women, anti-minority, anti-union, anti-poor, uh, you know, every negative you could put on the Republican Party had been done um, because of Vietnam, uh, civil rights, uh, Nixon, Watergate, the whole thing. And I was trying to create a different kind of party and, and it was a deliberate public uh, objective of getting women elected, minorities elected, young people elected, blue collar, union. And uh, we needed some, a catalytic agent. We needed something that would go beyond my efforts to go out and recruit candidates in all those communities to, to elect people who looked like the community instead of looked like in us. And here comes this guy, Kemp, who says, here's an issue that really is out of the out of the norm. It's exciting. It can pull people together who are not traditional Republicans. And around them we can gather and create a new party. So the issue fit beautifully in what I was trying to do in the, in the organizational side and the recruitment side. And I'm giving you too, way too long an answer and I apologize for that. But the, the point is uh, that where, where I was moving uh, in terms of the party and where Jack was moving in terms of uh, creating a, an issue that would energize people at every walk of life. Um, began to fold into a, a common purpose. And that was a, that got really exciting. Because uh, we had, up until that time, we still were fighting the old battles, the Humphrey Hawkins bill, the, uh, all of that kind of stuff. We had the one thing with Steiger with capital gains, but we did not have a bill that applied across the board to every person, every individual. And Jack Laffler, the guys that came up with this, and were able to put it in words that people could understand. Did Jack come to you? Did you go to Jack? How did this no, thing no, get concocted? No, no. Jack gets all the credit. He came to me. He came over to the office uh, at the RNC and he says, we have got to create an issue for the party. And this is it. There's nothing like this that is nearly as exciting. Nothing like this is gonna, you know, we, Remember at the time, uh, we had come out of Watergate, we had come out of a really horribly miserable experience. We'd elected this peanut farmer from Georgia that uh, was driving everybody crazy because uh, we, we, there was no definition to Jimmy Carter. He didn't know what he was gonna do other than he was gonna sit and, and opine on how we ought to be nicer. Uh, and I'm being totally unfair. But we were in the middle of horrible economic times, the Arab embargoes. We had three different em embargoes in a period of about six or seven years. It was running the price of fuel up through the roof. Uh, the economy was just sloughing along, could not get 
going at all. Uh, we were in, we, you know, we had things going wrong internationally where we were getting embarrassed, the Iranian hostage crisis. All of these things were piling up. And we were still fighting the old battles because we and the Democrats had sort of set our pattern and our pace. And, uh, and it was just easy to keep making the same arguments. And all we were doing was boring people to death. And here comes a guy who says, let me tell you how we can change the equation. We need something that will really shake the place up. It'll get a lot of people angry, it'll get a lot of people against us because it'll sound like we're, you know, we're trying to come up with simplistic answers. But this is how it works. And so we talked about, okay, I said, I'm with you. I love this idea. And we, then we talked about how could we make it a party position. Well, I said we can, you know, we, we'd created a couple of publications at the committee. We'd we could come up with some endorsements, things like that. But we needed something with, that would dramatize it. And over the course of two or three conversations, one of us, and I don't know, I give him credit, I don't know which one it was, said, let's put all of our really creative people on a plane and fly them to every media market in the United States. I'll pay for it, uh, and we'll get Bill Simon and everybody else that's willing to talk about, you know, creating this new approach to, to economic growth. Um, and we'll go out and, and we'll just take our message to, to people. A, we'll be in Oklahoma City or in Atlanta or in Chicago, so we get all the local press, but B, this will become a story in itself that the Republicans are going out with a whole new way of talking to people. Uh, I don't think I'd ever seen anybody do a tax blitz before with a, a plane with all the top people we had going out and beating the drums for a particular approach. But that was, that really made a difference. And it got a lot of excitement going in the party. All of a sudden, we had a focus. Uh, it wasn't entirely supported by a lot of people in the, in the Republican Party. But uh, I, I told the, the committee, I said, look, this party is moribund. We were down to 22, 23% public support. The Democrats were a hell of a lot better, but, but people were turned off. And I said, we gotta shake this thing up. So we've got to establish the issue foundation for our campaign in 1980 and we can't trust the politicians to do it. And it was almost that blunt. Uh, otherwise, we'll keep doing the same thing we've been doing. We'll fight the same battles we've been fighting. And so we have to, and we consciously, um, I brought in a, a media guy from the Thatcher campaign in England, uh, and we said, let's, let's find a way to add, do ads, do tax blitzes, do communication, all of which um, will shift this conversation entirely so that when we get a candidate, whether it was Bush or, or Reagan or whoever, uh, they're going to run our issues. So is this the period when you got close to Jack? Yes. And how much time did you spend with him? I don't know. Both of us were on the road trying to prove how smart we were. <laughs> or selling the message, whichever you want to put it. Uh, quite a bit, I guess. Quite a bit because we would also meet in the venue of things like chowder and marching. But, uh, you know, were we meeting weekly? Not at all. Was it at least, you know, eight, 10, 12 times in a year, which means averaging once a month? Yeah, at least, yes. that but somewhere in that range. Just let me uh, reconstruct the, the process here. He comes to your office at the Republican National Committee probably in 1977? Probably 78, but I'm, I would swear to that. I, I don't know the first. Going into the 78 yes. congressional campaign. Yeah. And did you, you knew about Kemp Roth already, about the across the board tax cuts. So did you instantly say, Jack, yes, or did it take you a couple of 
conversations? I think it was pretty quick. I think it probably was the first meeting that I, I probably said I like it. Uh, I'm going to run it by some people because I had some really good people with good brains, political brains, and on my staff that I trusted. But uh, I said, we need something like this, and you make it fun. Uh, you, going back to, to Jack, the human being, Jack, you know, he would bowl you over. He was so passionate, so excited, so, man, Rock, you gotta do this, come on, we gotta do it now. We don't, I don't need to talk to anybody, look at what we can do. And that was Jack Kemp. And you, uh, you caught the fever. It was you, contagious. You had been previous to that a sort of a Bob Dole kind of deficit cutting right? Republican. That's what I was talking about. My old, my old guard way of uh, saying, you know, we got to deal with the problem. Problem was uh, deficits, excessive spending, spending in areas that were stupid. Uh, things that were tamping down on growth. And I had not moved to the idea that really significant change in the quality of the way we tax uh, could create an energy. Because, yeah, I almost came to the position, and, and this is, both parties have a tendency to do this. Both parties have a tendency to say that uh, if we can define the problem and we address that problem, things will get better. I think what we were realizing in those days was even if we solved the problem, things weren't going to get any better because we were not doing some things that we hadn't even thought about. We were taxing our way to deficit reduction. We had a top rate of 70% top marginal rate, 50% if I remember something like that on capital gains. There was a time when we were taxing capital gains as regular income. But we were simply stopping the creation of capital formation in the United States. There was just no growth, particularly in the small business area, where most growth jobs were created. And so it was, it was easy to get in that rut of we've got to do a better job of deficit reduction, we've got to do a better job of accusing the other party of, of making it impossible for us to grow and not moving to the more affirmative approach that Kemp Roth brought to the equation. We could do it with capital gains with Bill Steiger. And I had no doubt about that. I was very aggressive in that area. But Kemp Roth did something across the board. Capital gains addressed a part of the problem. Yet in the 1978 New Jersey primary, you had Clifford Case, who was a conventional incumbent Republican senator, and Jeff Bell, who was running on Kemp Roth, and you supported Clifford Case. Now, was that simply because he was an incumbent? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have time to, uh, so I, 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 I frankly didn't think Jeff Bell was a good candidate. I didn't think he was uh, grabbing the kind of constituency we needed. Uh, I don't know how active I was for Clifford Case. We may have had some people up there, but I, I don't know, I, I don't remember endorsing. Uh, I didn't ever do that as far as I know, except for Jack Javits. And I got really angry at uh, the campaign that was running against him because it was grossly irresponsible. He still lost, and the guy that beat him still won the general election. And he proved I was right. <laughs> um, go back to your trip to England. W when did that take place, and what did you learn there, and what did you do? Margaret Thatcher was elected, I think, was it 1979? Um, so this is after the 78 election, you yeah, think? Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, I mean, the story is I kept hearing about this crazy woman that's just driving labor crazy and the, the labor government crazy in England. And it was pretty exciting. And she was talking about the same kind of issues that I found exciting. 
growth, jobs, lower taxes, getting the government out of everything. Labor had made the government into the most intrusive uh, of all places, as, as only the rich can do when they become socialists. And um, so I, I called the, the Conservative Party headquarters and said, I want to come over and spend some time with you guys. They said, come. Uh, they put me out in some writings listening to candidates. I worked through their entire advertising program, met with their ad people, spent the time with Margaret and Dennis Thatcher, spent the last day of the campaign on the bus with them, and just got blown away. I mean, they were just driving the labor people crazy. And I love their commercials. I love the fact that they were running things. They're so much better than any I'd ever seen in the United States. It's like British movies today. They're always better in American movies. Hollywood is so incompetent. And the Brits are so much better. I mean, they really have got some class. Uh, so it was, the campaign was just magnificent. I came back and called and said, who was the ad person that did those campaigns? They said it was an American named Jim Kello. And I called him and said, how fast can you get to Washington? I want to hire you to do media for the Republican National Committee. We've never done advertising for a party, neither party. And I want to take that message that you did in 10-minute spots and put it into 30-second, one-minute spots and start writing them to talk about what the Republican Party stands for. And he came, and we put them together, and they, they got sort of exciting. But that was, the timing was fabulous, because all of this fit. The, the, the Thatcher campaign was such a positive, upbeat, exciting campaign. That's what we were trying to generate uh, here. And by changing the composition of the party, by creating an opening for people to feel like we were them uh, again, uh, and by having an issue that people could say, oh, this really means we can get incomes up and jobs up again and get become America again. Uh, it was just a f great combination. And of course, we had our, a fabulous asset named Jimmy Carter in the White House who was talking about uh, malaise and you know, how America was just sort of slumping along. What was your favorite ad? Um, the one we won the Clio with, uh, Tim uh, O'Neill was the uh, Democratic leader in the House. He was a big old, really nice guy, classic, overweight Irish Paul out of Boston, and uh, well known, very publicly recognized figure. And Jim came up with this ad where you had a look-alike with Tip O'Neill driving a car and an obvious aide sitting on the right seat. And they're driving along, and the, and the assistant says, Mr. Speaker, we're running out of gas. Ho, 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 you know, sort of classic. A little bit. Mr. Speaker, we are running out of gas. Ah, wrong, we're crazy. Mr. Speaker, we are running out of pump, 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 and the car sort of clumps down. And O'Neill gets out of the car, kicks the tire, and the line was, the Democrats are out of gas, vote Republican for a change. And we had more people. We didn't have enough money to run, run that, you know, with a thousand gross rating points everywhere. But the press loved it, so they kept running all night. And they, no news. <laughs> so we got we got a whole lot more than we could possibly have afforded, uh, because we were doing things that no party has done. And again, you could build around uh, the energy that was creating with our issue side, our recruitment side, uh, and this it all it all fit. So going back to the '78 uh, campaign and Kemp Roth. Um, how did you convince, and what part of the what part of the Republican Party were you able to convince to make this your key message for the '78 congressional campaign? And who were you not able to convince? Um, it sounds like. Uh,
It sounds like I'm blowing smoke, but the truth is that uh, when the party is as down as it was, and it was down on itself, um, I, I decided, and I had very strong support within the committee, uh, and obviously even my staff, that we didn't have to talk to anybody about what we were going to do. The party didn't have a message, and so we said, we have to create one. They didn't have a campaign, we have to create one. They didn't have any development program for getting young people, minorities, women. Uh, we had to create our own. So I never, it never occurred to me to go to anybody in the House or the Senate and say, we're going to endorse this issue. Uh, I said, we're going to do it and apologize if that's for not consulting, not for the issue. And we, we never, I don't ever remember having a meeting with the Republican leader in the House of the Senate saying we're going to do this. Uh, I didn't have time and, and frankly didn't, I didn't want to convince anybody. We, we, we were going to get into the wrong argument if we were trying to convince Republicans to, to do something different. That's so, why Jack was fun. Jack wasn't convincing anybody. He was trying to get the American people ginned up. Uh, what role specifically did Jack play in that 78 campaign? Was he on the was he was he on, on the, the road. He was on the road, mm -hmm. sure. And who else was on that plane? <sighs> and I have to get out the list. Uh, Bill Simon was obvious. Laffler, I think, was on the plane. Um, I don't know if Greenspan was. I think he may have been. Um, was the plane the key thing that you used for the 78 campaign, or were there ads? No, we didn't do ads until uh, the 80 campaign. We started running ads in 79 and 80. Okay. Um, uh, in the, uh, in, in, at the Miller Center mm -hmm. session, um, I think it was David Hoppe who said that there wasn't, wasn't even a majority of Republican senators who supported Kemp Roth uh, when the Nunn Amendment got passed, actually, by 62 to 28 or something like that in, in the Senate, that it was just people wanting to say that they were against taxes, uh, raising taxes. So I gather that means that your message was catching on that raising taxes was a bad idea. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, yes, yeah. I sure do. That was one of the things that was so hard about what we were trying to do was that the Republican Party was in a rut. I'm not sure that I had not been in that same rut a few years earlier. But what we, what we figured out uh, when I when I t took over as chairman, we said we need to define who we are. We asked Republicans to say what 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 do you look like if you're a Republican? And I used to use this in my speech. I said we are white Anglo-Saxon, uh, largely Protestant, uh, middle-aged, middle-income, Buick-driving people who live in the Northeast. That's Republican. And I used to end that by saying, I need to find a statistician to show how to compose a majority out of that group. Because uh, if you don't have a majority, you don't win elections. And if we can't do that, then we've got to find out why we don't have women and young people in the eyes, blue collar, and so forth. So all of those things were, were sort of fitting into a normal pattern. For me and the committee and for the younger guys, the Kemp's of the world, and we were asking uh, a lot of very good, very talented, very caring Republican leaders to shift spots, to shift gears, and to adopt something that they weren't quite sure they were for. Uh, it was out of the norm. It was out of the pattern. And so we said, we got to do it for them, and we're going to make it impossible for us our candidate, whoever the I mean, the, the conscious decision was to make it a Republican issue, 
party issue for the entire Republican Party. And the person who was going to articulate that version, vision was going to be the president, whoever, or the president nominee, whoever the party nominated. So we had to create a situation where that nominee had his issues already pre-cooked before he got the nomination or she got the nomination. And then they couldn't not endorse that position because it was the party's position. And nobody's going to take on his own party after getting the nomination or even in the process of running for it. So we were trying to pre-cook the deal. And the, that's where Jack really got the things moving. I mean, I was lucky to be in the right place. He was lucky to be in the right place. But he made it the right place. So how did you do in 78? We picked up uh, a lot of members of Congress, uh, over 20-odd 20, 20 number I've forgotten. We, uh, we picked up some governors. We picked up a bunch of legislators. Part of our goal that had nothing to do with issues was to get, we, we had to get control of enough state legislative bodies or governorships to have a voice in the redistricting that was going to come after the decennial census in 1980. So we put a huge amount of energy into local elections. Again, the party had never, well, I guess they did with Ray Bliss. We put more focus there than, than I think has ever been done. And we consciously were recruiting people from within the community that looked like the community. That was our mantra uh, in order to, uh, to get people to realize that Republicans looked like them. And so we, we, we made a good start in legislative elections in 78. So Did you think of Jack Kemp as a potential president or vice president in those days? Uh, I thought it was very possible that he could be a vice presidential selection by the nominee. I did not see him as... Going into the 1980 campaign, did you know about this plan that Arthur Laffer and Jude Winiski had to try to get the vice presidential nomination, Reagan's vice presidential nomination for Kemp? I didn't know about the plan. I knew that uh, those two were conspiring always uh, and that uh, there would be an effort on Jack's part, which was not illogical. He was a young firebrand, exciting. Would have been an asset. There was a big demonstration on his behalf at the convention. That's correct. Did you think it was going to go anywhere? Uh, Mort, you, you remember the conversations that were really going on behind the scenes were the conversations about getting Jerry Ford to be on the ticket. Uh, so I really didn't think uh, anything would go on Jack. I thought that there could have been a deal to get Ford and Reagan paired. Uh, Kissinger was really pushing that. But uh, I, don't, I, I, I guess I didn't know what Reagan thought of Kemp. Uh, I thought obviously they were close because Kemp was supporting him. He stuck his neck out earlier, four years earlier. I just didn't know uh, where that might lead. He was he was a player. He could have been. When Reagan got so mad at uh, what Kissinger was doing that uh, anything could have happened, but I think he was looking for more uh, somebody to pick up the traditional Republican base. That was the logic of George Bush. Uh, the, uh, the Connecticut uh, middle income white <laughs> Buick drivers. <laughs> okay, so um, Reagan gets elected 
and from 81 to 87, your U.S. Trade Representative and then and then Secretary of Labor. Um, how much contact did you have with Kemp in those days, the passage of the Kemp-Roth bill and so on? A lot less uh, because my, uh, my focus was entirely on international trade for those first four plus years. And I was traveling a lot. I was overseas uh, trying to kickstart U.S. free trade agreement with Israel, then Canada, Uruguay uh, round. Um, so I was, I was out of that circle. Mm -hmm. Did you hear, was there any chatter in the cabinet, uh, you know, Stockman, Baker, Regan, or the president himself about Kemp? I'm sure there was a good deal. I, I just don't remember anything that sticks out, to be honest. So you were much less close to him in this period than yeah. you were in yeah. previous I, periods. I moved into such a different area. And what about the gold standard? He was a, he was an advocate of the gold standard, which sort of has something to do with international trade. Um, did was it ever on the agenda of the Reagan administration? No. And I did talk to Jack about that. And uh, I'm not sure. I said he was smoking something illegal, but I uh, I said that he was <laughs> he was simply wrong. <laughs> Why? Because I thought we had moved beyond that. I thought the, uh, he and I had different views on the Federal Reserve System. And my, my sense was that the, uh, the Fed was an, an incredibly important institution that uh, performed a much more positive function or role in the economy. And I felt like the gold standard would, uh, would tie our hands. And he and I just simply had a pretty vigorous disagreement. Uh, and at least two or three different conversations in that regard. Uh, you know, it was not anything that was going to affect the relationship. It wasn't anything that uh, that I was going to go out and campaign on. You know, I had I had my problems, and he was off on that. I, I didn't think that Jack. I got, I never got the passion about the gold standard issue that I did about Kemp Roth. He felt strongly about it. He would argue about it. He was vehement on the subject. Uh, he was. A little too dismissive of those who disagreed, uh, but I didn't feel that that was as much of a core of Jack as the other. I take it you're still against going back to the gold standard. It's a dumb idea. Why is it such a dumb idea? The those who argue for it say that the, the Federal Reserve System has not been good for the dollar. The dollar is too weak or too strong, depending on how what their policy is, and uh, that if we tied the, if there was an exchange with gold, that it would stabilize things and prevent inflation and so on. What what's wrong with the gold standard? Well, if the world were on a gold standard, that uh, it's conceivable they would provide uh, some stability, but doing it unilaterally. Uh, ties your hands. Uh, you cannot relax. I mean, th this is not a world where we are the only source of power and strength and economic uh, uh, coherence. This is a global economy. Other people can game it, as the Greeks have done uh, in the Euro. That might be almost a comparable example where they've got one standard for the European community. And, and here's one country that says, "Oh, look at what this did! It let me uh, let me let me irresponsible for a while." I think the same thing could happen in the gold standard if you aren't careful, and that creates a, a whole different set of problems. We've got to be able to compete. We've got to do so by maintaining uh, economic stability at home. We, that means we've got to deal with our own problems. Gold gold doesn't deal with deficits. Gold doesn't deal with uh, spending. Gold deals with currency. That's not the same thing. Um, on another issue that he was involved with, when you were Secretary of Labor, did you have anything to do with the Enterprise Zone? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just it was an exciting idea that uh, that I could say I think made a whole lot of sense and could support. 
it, it was not anything that we would engage in in terms of the Department of Labor, its, it's functioning uh, operations. Uh, it was, you know, when I was out making a speech, I could say this is a, this is a terrific idea. We need to show the example of what works. We need to get some energy going again. Okay, during, now, you've told me about an incident when you and Jack were going to a Super Bowl. We're not going to get too far into this. <laughs> okay, but uh, this was the issue of HIV AIDS, yes. right? Uh, the Surgeon General, Everett Koop, had reported that this was going to devastate Africa, and you're flying to the Super Bowl. Say what happened. Uh, Jack thought it was more of an issue uh, that was generated by, it, 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 I'm sure he was overstating his, his views in order to get my juices flowing, which he did, by the way, uh, but that it was uh, something that was overemphasized by some doctors and some drug companies to get more research money, whatever. Uh, and I just sort of exploded. I had heard Dr. Coop uh, talking about the explosion in AIDS, how it was simply something we couldn't deal with. We didn't had any answers to. Uh, and it was not going to be an, an African problem for long. It was spread quickly. And uh, we had a, a thoroughly strong, vigorous debate in which uh, the intensity translated into probably some flushed faces and so forth. Shoving match? Well, I'm not sure I'd go that far, but uh, I didn't want to get in a shoving match with Jack Kemp. It might lead to something worse. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that strikes me as being out of character for somebody who was supposedly, that was usually, compassionate about one issue, immigrants, whatever. I mean, Jack and I agreed on so many things, uh, and, 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 and I would completely take your point. Uh, I, can't, I can't think of anything we would disagree with in terms of, uh, of compassion or, or immigration or, or any of the issues relating to minorities, uh, poverty. Um, And you know, in, in thinking about it, I wonder if he was just pulling my chain. But he may have, if, if he was, he did it. <laughs> so, but he, he was pretty vigorous in his response. So I don't know, somebody must have said something to him that made him think that uh, Dr. Coop was, had been led down the primrose path in, uh, into something that Do you was think this has any? Do you think this has anything to do with his Christian science background, that he sort of thought that all disease was kind of mm. spiritual or something like that? Now, that never occurred to me. I have no idea. I can't... I don't know. I, I mean, okay. I, 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 that doesn't make sense to me. All right. Going into uh, 1988, you are, are Bob Dole's campaign manager, chairman, and Kemp is running for president. Um, talk about the Kemp campaign as you saw it from the Dole perspective. Um, I didn't take Jack's campaign seriously. Uh, I didn't think it was well put together. I thought it was a little bit too chaotic. I think the I thought the the opposition was almost entirely, uh, as it turned out to be, George Bush. I didn't see Kemp racing the kind of money that was necessary. Uh, and I was sensitive to that because when I came to the Dole campaign, it had been going on for about three months and they'd already spent uh, a substantial amount of money that we're allowed to spend under the campaign finance reform laws. Uh, so I was desperately looking for how I could save money and and spend less and still uh, win some primaries. And so those were the issues I was concerned with. Jack, uh, Jack was not posing any problems for us. George Bush was. And he didn't last very long. Oh. 
Um, did you talk to him at all during this period? Not that I recall. Do you know how he took his loss? Um, I don't, other than knowing him, uh, he was moving on the next day. What did Dole think about Kemp? <laughs> you, know, you should ask Bob. <laughs> I think uh, Doe was more on the classic Republican side. Doe would have viewed Jack almost from the outset of his early days as someone that uh, was a little too brash, a little too active on issues that uh, were not consistently uh, in the mainstream. I got caught in a trap in that regard. It's my fault entirely, but... Uh, How so? I, uh, I had tried to uh, convince uh, the vice president to make uh, human development the, the core of his campaign, education, skill development, work, workforce development, and uh, had failed. And I had uh, had an unpleasant conversation with his campaign manager about uh, uh, how they were going to respond to Iran Contra, which uh, I didn't agree agree with what they're doing. And though Elizabeth and Bob asked me a, a moment of weakness, and I decided that uh, Bob might not have been the best, strongest candidate in the world. As it turned out, I was understating the problem. But he was a good man and a friend and a colleague uh, that I'd worked with. And I agreed to support him. Not the wrong decision, uh, wrong outcome, but... Uh, it was a messy campaign, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a messy campaign. And I had an internal conflict overall consequence with the people that had been running it up until the time I came on board. And there was no, uh, no agreement on how to run the campaign, and I finally had to let them go. And we just, it was just too little, too late. Uh, and sometimes you, uh, you have to look back and say, I wish I'd done something different. Not in terms of supporting him. Still think he's an incredible human being. I think he would have been a good president. But campaign was a horrible experience. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, in, so then in, in uh, Bush wins, he becomes President of the United States, um, and then Kemp becomes HUD Secretary. Now, what contact, if any, did you have with him during that, that time? Because that... Uh, nothing in substantive terms. Uh, we, would have run in, we would run into each other in different events. Uh, I thought Jack was doing a terrific job, told him so. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of a conversation you'd have any time, any way I can help. You're doing great, keep it up kind of stuff. Was this just at social events, or were, did you and your family gather, gather with his family? Probably or? largely social events, yeah. How often would you see him, would you say, in those days? I have no idea. Several times a year, but... Uh, Again, nothing like uh, weekly or anything like that. Okay, nothing it, formal. Moving uh, on to 1996, um, do you have any idea why Kemp decided not to run? I do not. Okay. Um, and who did you support that year? I know. Uh, Oh, well, obviously, I ultimately. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine uh, moving off of my horse. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Were you surprised that Dole picked Kemp? Yes, I was. He didn't ask me about it, for sure. I would have said, great idea, great, great combination. Uh, it wasn't. 
I don't think Jack really got into that one. Uh, Talk about that. Well, I'm, ju I'm viewing from afar. Uh, we didn't have a conversation. Um, I thought Jack, honestly, I think he, I thought he took, and think, he took it too lightly. I think he went into that first debate confident that he could just chew his opponent up out of just sheer joy of his experience and his love of the debate. And I think he went in totally unprepared. And I think he got his hand hat handed to him. And I was very, very surprised. I was disappointed because Jack was a lot better than that. And I don't know if he was tired or just overly confident, but it was not Jack's best moment. I mean, he was better than that. So you think Gore won? You think Gore won that debate? Yeah, I certainly do. And I'm the last person to give him a lot of praise. But yeah, I think he ate, ate Jack up. And that's just crazy to me because Jack is so much better than that. Do you have any idea why it happened? I do not. I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming that as I said earlier, that uh, I, I, I think he took it too lightly. I think he thought Gore was sort of deadly dull, which he is, and uh, one a one-note Johnny, which he can be, and that Jack could come in with all of his energy and excitement and creativity and and own it. And Gore was much better than he expected him to be much better prepared, and Jack was caught off balance on any number of questions that he simply didn't, hadn't thought about and wasn't ready for. And what about Jack's other campaigning activities? What did you think about them? That year? I didn't see enough of him. I never felt uh, that he was as engaged as I would have expected. I would have thought Jack would have been the flamethrower. He would be out the spirit, the guy with the javelin in his hand, going for it big time. Uh, and I didn't see that. So what's the period when you and Jack were closest? I don't know how to answer that. Uh, we had the most contact and the, I think the, the most fun conversations in that early period uh, from his first or second term through the time when I was national chairman through 80, um, we had a common vision, we had a common sense that the party had to get energized off its duff into uh, some areas that were more fun, more exciting, and that would get people back to believing in government and politics again. American people were not unlike they are today. They were really, really down on the system. And that's a really, really dangerous thing to happen in this country. And both of us felt that we could, we could change that, and I think we did for a while. So describe his style as a person. Would you say that he was warm? Did he confide in people? Were you, were you friends? I mean, real close friends or not? Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty good friends. I, uh, and, and I'm not sure that we confided that much. We shared so many interests and concerns and, and beliefs that that was almost the essence of the conversation. We could get into talking about other individuals. What did you think? How do we get so and so involved? What what do we need to do about uh, about her or him? Um, and we never talked about. Uh, we're both spiritually grounded. And. Uh, 
I'm sure we had some conversations along that line, uh, largely because of, of not just the two of us, but because of Joanne and, and my wife Muffet. Uh, but in terms of uh, other things, it was just, it was fun to be with him. And I think he may have felt somewhat the same way. Do you think he had any particular weaknesses or flaws? Yeah. He was not the world's greatest listener. Uh, that's probably true of most of us at one time or another. But Jack, uh, when he got on a path, he was on it. And then it was devil take the hindmost. That's good. Nothing wrong with it. But it could have been maybe even better had he sought uh, the advice, participation of a broader range of people. He, uh, he really believed in the force of ideas. And he had the personality that would say, uh, you got to do it, you got to do it. Let's, this is going to change the world. You know. And that excitement is, is productive and it's contagious and it's wonderful. Uh, it probably could have been even better if he had engaged some. He had a close circle of people on the, in the Laffler camp and what Jude Winneski and, and those. I didn't sense how far it went beyond that. And it's, at a point he would lose people Dave Stockman being a, an example uh, that had been with him. Do you think that, uh, that in the case of David Stockman that Kemp lost Stockman or did Stockman, was Stockman ever really in the supply side system? That's a fair question and I think maybe it more the latter. I don't know that but I tend to think the Stockman was uh, a bit less of a totally committed supply sider. Uh, you you were in the cabinet with him. Yep. And were you surprised that Stockman turned against, basically turned against Reagan? I was, um, very much so. Uh, I saw it beginning to slide that way because David would uh, ask me to come in and uh, sit with him a couple of times when he was getting ready to put the budget together and what do you think, can we get away with this? What do you think about that? How will, how will the Congress react? How, how will the President react? What do you think about this or that? And uh, we were beginning to get into the old argument about uh, deficits and whether or not the, uh, the tax changes that Reagan had would in fact create the revenue growth that would offset the increase in, in expenditures. And Dave, uh, I think rightly said he didn't think they would. Well, that went against uh, dogma in the White House. And uh, that just sort of slid into an increasingly frustrating difference between him and and the Don Regans, the Jim Beggars, and the, and the Ronald Regans. And the Jack Kemp's. Of well. course. Of so course. did Jack Kemp say anything negative about Stockman or for that matter about anybody? <laughs> I don't remember that. Uh, I know he was disappointed uh, because he felt like Stockman was part of the team. But I don't remember Jack Kemp saying really negative things about anybody particularly. Uh, that was not where he was. He was going to talk issues, not personalities. Uh, he, uh, he could get people into uncivil conversations because he was so aggressive and so active and so passionate. Other than That's your AIDS different. conversation, what, 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 do you have an example? No, no, but, uh, but I, people reacted to Jack 
as we were talking much earlier back in the in the days of Chowder March and the con that those conversations because he uh, he was just too passionate about things and they were not ready for that and part of that was that he had not courted them he didn't do that uh, he didn't go and and work them and say well, what do you think uh, and and that was not his his uh, approach in many of these cases. But in terms of him uh, saying this guy's a bum, this guy's a crook, I don't think I ever heard that, anything like that, out of him. He just didn't judge people like that. It was all issues. They were, could be wrong, but he didn't challenge integrity. We're almost done. What do you think is the a continuing re relevance of supply side economics. Do you think that it uh, has sort of taken over the party at all, that it's become a religion, and it, or not? I mean, do you think the tax cuts are the answer anytime, any place, as seems to be Republican policy now? I think tax, I think dogma is always wrong. And I think, I, I, I guess I wouldn't blame supply side so much as the theology of tax cuts per se, not, they don't even make the argument anymore that it, uh, it's essential to growth. I mean, why don't we have zero taxes? You have any growth? No. You'd have chaos. Uh, so what the dogma has led us as a party and too much of the country into is this sense that uh, a tax is a tax is a tax and that makes it evil, evil, evil. I've seen people uh, in state legislatures voting against cigarette taxes because they're a tax. Well, why don't they grow up? Um, we've got a tax system that is not coherent. It is counterproductive. And by saying all taxes are bad, it, it keeps you from looking at the, at the core of the issue is that are some good and some bad and what's the right combination? To have a trillion two hundred million dollars two hundred billion dollars in tax expenditures today when we got the deficits that we have is just the most outrageously inexcusable uh, absence of a personal responsibility or corporate responsibility I can imagine. And here are the Grover Northquist of the world out there asking people to sign a tax pledge, saying no tax, no tax, no tax, ever, ever, ever. And, and then they pervert that into saying that even a removal of a tax expenditure that is irresponsible to wit on ethanol, much less some of these other jerk things that are benefiting special interests because they had some damn good special lobbyist, uh, it keeps you from doing what we desperately need to do, which is come up with a better system of producing revenue to finance some things in government that really need to be funded. You can be as absolutist as you want to and say all we need is the FBI and the CIA and the, and the military and the police department. Uh, but the world doesn't work that way. And. Uh, and I really and truly do worry that we've got ourselves in a bind, and the Democrats have themselves in a bind. They say that it doesn't matter. We can afford anything because it's the right thing to do. And they absolutely lack any sense of responsibility for the consequence of their actions and what they're doing to the poor people of this country. But that's a debate we're not even having because we argue absolutes. Spend more on entitlements, spend less on taxes, get more revenue, less on taxes. And we're not discussing the real problem. Now, I resent the, the, the slide into dogma and demagoguery. And I think both parties are abundantly guilty. Can you speculate as to where Kemp would be in current political terms? Jack Kemp would be right on path with me. I am absolutely positive about that. He would be saying, of course tax cuts can generate revenue. 
But when you get to the point where they're generating more deficits than there is any conceivable revenue opportunity, there's something wrong. He would be saying nobody can justify spending 25% of the American people's research GDP on expenditures, which is what we're doing today. But neither can anybody say we ought to be spending, you know, 16% or, or spending revenue is 16% of GDP uh, when it's creating a collapse of the dollar, which means inflation, which means low growth, which means poor people get hurt worse. Uh, he was smart enough to know that there is some competent resolution. He'd be looking at tax expenditures. Uh, he'd be saying, how in the hell can you justify uh, not means testing Medicare or Social Security? I mean, why should, you know, we're all talking about anybody with what a quarter million. That, uh, I'm venting, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> I, I don't have any doubt that we would be having a different conversation if he were here than the either side right now. It's what we did in, the, in that's, that's almost what we did in 1970s, Mort. We had two parties frozen in, in, the, in their style and in their approach. May have been fine for the 50s or 60s. It was not fine for the 70s. And by moving entirely away from that, and that's where supply side did make a difference, we changed the quality of the debate. We changed the attitude of the country. We got the country energized, and not just economically, in terms of people believing again, getting involved again, getting excited again. And we got our spirits back. And so much of government is a matter of attitude. If you believe, it'll work. If you don't, forget it. So what does, uh, final question, what does uh, the Jack Kemp career teach the Republican Party in the country? Oh, wow. Um, quit, quit acting like accountants. Get passionate. Forgive me if you want to be in accounting. But, uh, um, believe enough in something to get excited about it. Get excited enough about it to engage and fight for what you believe in. But in the process, listen and bring others in because none of this can do it by ourselves. Uh, the reason for a political party is, is not to tell people how to think. The reason for a political party is to give people access to the process so they feel like they get a voice. That's more important than any single issue we can come up with. And Jack believed that people in this country deserved a voice. They also deserved opportunity. He put more opportunity in front of voice than I think was in the final analysis as helpful as it could have been if, if we could have gotten more people involved. I don't think we'd have the Grove of Norquist with our absolute dogma running things now. Uh, but we're not, we move so far down the path of absolutes that people are incapable of listening right now. And that's something that is really, really, really scary to me. Okay, thank you so much.